Hi, everybody. I'm all about the journey. I took the subway this morning, and it, it's always a journey. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I am here to tell you about sort of two journeys that I took my listeners on. Um, you don't have to say if you listen to my podcast, but are there podcast listeners out here? Do you, are you into podcasts? Yeah. They're, and I do think, like for me, what I love about podcasts, just to pick up on what Mark just was saying, you can go on an outer journey, which could be a jog or washing your dishes, and go on this beautiful inner journey when you listen to podcasts is what I love so much about them. Um, and so I'm thrilled to say that I think I have the best job in like the world, and I'm going to tell you what I did um, with some of my listeners. So Note to Self uh, started out as a pretty basic tech show, but what we realized was that this podcast medium, which has grown so rapidly over the last two years, was really this amazing opportunity for me to really get into inside people's brains. And what they reacted to was less like, oh, there's this startup, or oh, this is happening in the tech industry. What they really reacted to were the very personal stories that we told about how technology was changing the way that we meet our loved ones, the way that we work, the way that we parent, the way that we think about ourselves. That was really where we found um, people really reacted. And so we really changed the show, revamped, revamped it from being this local tech show to being very much a national sort of look. And we really decided that we needed the listeners to be part of this um, experience. Um, so because I really do, and I do believe this very strongly, that the more that we understand technology, the more we actually understand ourselves, what motivates us, and also this is how we can start to live smarter, kinder lives online and off. Um, on a less serious note, I'm going to show you a video um, that sort of kicked me off on the project, one of the projects I'm going to tell you about today. are walking by, but how many of them are looking at their phones? How many of them are using their phone? That could be like listening to earbuds or something. They're interacting. They're having their phone is part of what they're doing. And there's a lot of people sort of getting to work. They're zoning out. And then there are other people who are looking at their phones like, I have to get this done before I walk into the office, I guess is what they're doing. And then there are people who are just like gripping their phones. They're not looking at them, but they're at the ready. If they needed to look at their phone, they could. Celebrity even walked by. Emily Blunt walked by. Was she on her phone? No. She was having a zen moment. I think she was coming from the gym. You can see that was uh, before we rebranded re to be Note to Self. Um, and I'm also wearing the same sweater, which I think is kind of <laughs> interesting. It's obviously my like fun sweater. Um, <clears throat> so more about who I am. Um, I was a hardcore journalist, war zones, the whole thing. Um, had two kids. Uh, yeah, prone to anxiety, so not good in war zone situations, um, but I managed. Um, but I did want to stay sort of static, and podcasting was like the place that I found really a wonderful home. And, um, and so for me, 
when I, I was like, wow, I have this job where my, it, I have to come up with creative ideas. And I was like, okay, I'm ready for a big one. Here we go. And like, I don't know, have you ever had that happen where you sit down and you're like, shit, there's nothing there. There is nothing there. No one was home. And so I sort of was like, what is my problem these days? Is this like writer's block? What is this? And I started to sort of deconstruct. Okay, so when did I come up with my best ideas? Total cliche. Looking out the window when I was on a train ride, waiting in line to pick up my latte, right? Those sort of times when you just are spacing out in the shower, those shower moments. Um, but then I kind of realized, like I hadn't been bored, like had those spacing out moments since like 2008, which was when I got my iPhone. Fun fact, the iPhone and my first uh, born were, came out uh, in June 2007. <laughs> um, so like, I love them both. Um, and what I realized was like, I was always looking at my phone when I used to be spacing out. Like when I was on the subway, I was looking at my phone. If I was waiting for my coffee, great opportunity to be on my phone, right? Like you didn't need those cracks in your day and your more. You could be productive. Um, but I wondered like, was there a consequence to not having these moments of boredom? And I spoke to neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists <laughs> who told me, yeah, you, this could be a problem. Now, it's important to note here that the scientific research into what these mobile devices and being online and all of these things, they are way behind where we are, right? I mean, they have to have it peer reviewed and all of those things, and yet we could probably tell them a lot of what we think is happening to us. But as I delve deeper, I learned that when you get bored, you activate a very special neural network in your brain. It's called the default mode. When you are in the default mode, your body isn't doing anything, but your mind is actually incredibly active. Uh, you do something called autobiographical planning, which I found fascinating. Literally, you are cataloging what happened to you and then making sense of how you move forward. Um, and so I wanted to know, wow, this seems like, like if we're not activating our default modes enough, that really seems slightly worrisome. Um, and I wanted to know that if, if we used our phones differently, could we purposefully activate this default mode. Could we make ourselves get more bored? Like what would happen if we were like, took back this idea that boredom is bad? Like could we maybe help ourselves have better ideas? Could we help ourselves live better, think better, parent better? What would happen? Could we even be more brilliant is what I wondered. Um, and so I proposed to my audience, I said, what if we do our own experiments? Because the science isn't out there. What if we sort of try to figure it out? And I said, let's figure out how much time we're spending on our phones, and let's see if we change our behavior in different ways, if we could possibly think better. So we called the project Bored and Brilliant, The Lost Art of Spacing Out, and thousands of people signed up. And they told us they were looking for three things. Well, they were worried, really, about three things. They were worried that they were not being as productive as they used to be, they were concerned that they were addicted to their phones, and they were also worried about their health more broadly, not sleeping, things like that. Um, but they also wanted data, because we all love data these days, right? It's quantified self, and so what we did was we partnered with um, two apps, uh, Moment for iPhone, iOS, and Break Free for Android, and what they did was they measured not just how many minutes a day you were on your phone, but how many pickups. You know what I mean? Like you get in the elevator and you automatically look at your phone. What's shocking is it's really become like a reflex and I think a lot of us don't even realize how many times a day we just glance at our phone. Um, and so for us, it was, you know, it was fun to see. Um, we were all, to, cumulatively, and trust me, the spectrum was long, um, averaging just over two hours a day on our phones and we were checking our phones around 60 times. It's a lot of time, a lot of looking at your phone. And keep in mind, there's like my mom who looks at her phone four times a day. And then we also had a lot of teenagers who were looking exponentially more. So that's the average there. Um, and what we did was we asked them to take a daily challenge. So every day they would get a podcast with the corresponding research, we sort of explained why we had come up scientifically with each challenge. And then we said, you know, do it. So day one was put it in your pocket. 
Um, keep your phones out of sight when you're in transit, so no walking and texting, not allowed. Um, but everybody did agree that day three was the hardest challenge. It was delete the app that you know that app. You know that one, right? It's that one, well, from, I'll, okay, I'll open my kimono here. This is mine. Um, did anybody play two dots? Oh my God, do not start playing it, okay? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It had become my gin and tonic. Oh, the dots guy was here last year, actually. Yes, he, it's a great game. <laughs> but for those of us who like can't handle it, like I deleted it. Um, and I want you to know that it's been about 17 months. Um, my name is Manoush, and I was M, a two dots addict. Um, and so I can't put it back on my phone, and I now know that about myself. Amazing how much time I got back when I took it off. Um, so in the end, this was just baby steps, right? Like, we totally got it. The data, I know, right? So sad. The data I didn't think was actually that impressive. The average decrease was six fewer minutes of phone use each day. Parents, we did a little better. We cut down 16. Gamers, God, gamers, yes. 20 minutes, that's pretty good for gamers, I think. But you know what was interesting to me, like, and I didn't expect this, was the stories that people came back to me. 70% after challenge week said that they felt like they had more time to think. And they told us things like, I feel like I'm becoming myself again for the first time in several years. I pick up my guitars more. I go to bed earlier. I sleep better. I am happier. My friends can't believe I don't have Facebook on my phone anymore. Some people could not put it back. Other people were like, I'm done with this break. I'll put it back. My favorite was this guy, Billy, in Brooklyn, who said, I feel as though I am waking up from a mental hibernation. And I think really most gratifying was the reaction that we got from teachers, from educators, and from students. I mean, we had kids who were saying, I was having a lot of trouble in school. It was really hard for me to understand the material. Well, amazing that if you study while you're on Instagram, how you don't get what's going on. The brain is funny like that. So schools, they asked for curriculum plans at the end of that week. The freshmen at University of New Orleans asked to do Bored and Brilliant at the beginning of every single semester. Um, sort of this idea that a reset for your brain. Authors told me that they finished writing their books finally. Entrepreneurs wrote in to say that they had solved a, pre a very pressing problem at work. Um, Here's an example. This is Joel Adams. He's a teacher at Stanton College Prep in Jacksonville, Florida. All right, everyone. So last week, we talked about the Board and Brilliant Project. How many of you are going to participate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. So what did you observe after they did it? Like, what did you see? Was there, like, I don't know, twitching? <laughs> not, not twitching, more eye contact, actually. Uh, one of the things that um, we're in a pretty tech-saturated classroom, so they're usually, they're always in front of screens of some sort. And I think part of what this project actually also did was try to highlight for them that, from the, uh, again, from the moment they wake up till they fall asleep, there are always screens in front of them, whether it's their mobile screen, uh, a screen in a classroom, the uh, desktop, uh, or a projection screen. And so to actually have them delete an app or to begin to put the phone away from their body was another good one. Uh, you, you saw a lot more of their eyes. They were looking at each other. Uh, and even though they sit right next to each other every day, uh, I, it was a different experience, I think, for them. I think it's really interesting to look at this on a macro level, too. There was a, a study done by IBM. They surveyed 1,500 CEOs. And the number one competency that they said that they were most looking for in leaders of the future was creativity. How do we get to those deep, creative, big ideas if we don't give ourselves some quiet, some time. It's busy, right? It's really busy. I feel really busy most of the time. So really carving out those ideas. So in the end, we had 20,000 people who participated. We had 50 states, dozen countries, 90% cut down on phone time, 70% got more time to think. But really, I think in terms of the numbers, Whatever, what we heard were stories of feeling, people feeling empowered again, feeling that their phone had been turned back into a tool rather than a master, which was super exciting. I thought there was no way we could top this. I was so excited. And then 
we did this one. So three months ago, we did a project called InfoMagical. And this was less about your phone and more about the stuff coming out of your phone. This was about trying to make information overload disappear because what we heard from all of our listeners and the people who did Bored and Brilliant was another problem. I want to play that for you. When we wake up in the morning, there's this endless loop of personal emails, text messages, voicemails, work emails, work meetings. My question is about focus and how technology is affecting it. Uh, direct messages, status updates, friend requests from Twitter, Facebook. Do we get stuck in the loop of just browsing at things that make us feel good or look nice, and then we become so overwhelmed with all of the ideas that we just don't do it? What does that do? LinkedIn, Instagram, etc. Each medium forces us to review, make a decision, keep, delete, reply, and move to the next request. When you finally reach that one day when you feel like you've conquered managing all of your cues, the feeling is short-lived when you fall behind tomorrow. Any help or suggestions or best practices? Any help or suggestions? Um, no, I really didn't have any. I was really struggling with information overload myself. Um, so we surveyed about 2,000 of our listeners. Here are some of the words that came up. And I thought what was so interesting was you see there's this ambivalence, right? Like overload, prioritizing, what's happening, knowledge. Knowledge is wonderful, but FOMO is not demands, not so much. And in fact, 75% of our listeners said that they often continued consuming information despite feeling as though they had reached information overload. I totally knew that feeling. You know that thing at night when you're like this on your phone? You're like, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I'm, so, I'm relaxing, I'm relaxing right now, right? Like for me, it's couches on Pinterest has replaced uh, two dots. Um, we don't have to go into that right now. So here's what they told us why. I don't want to miss something that will inspire me. I feel a need to always stay up to date so I'm not embarrassed if something comes up in conversation. I am somehow deeply convinced that I should be able to accomplish more in a day than I would ever expect of anyone else. I totally get that. I want to be more productive. I want to be inspired. I want to do all of those things. But when I described this desire to constantly consume more and more information, despite having this nagging feeling that my brain was full, I got a diagnosis. Yeah, contemporary modern digital junkies. Um, there are a lot of us, it turns out. see that very, very often among people who live in urban areas, um, in bigger cities, that they are, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're starving for information, they're craving information because they feel that that level of information will actually make them better informed. They're keeping up, you know, with friends and family, we're keeping up because they want to be educated. In reality, what a digital junkie is actually doing is overindulging information, and information that's not actually being stored or, or, or sort of, you know, said in a meaningful way that can actually mean something and contribute to their level of, you know, general knowledge. So more information doesn't actually make you better informed. This seemed kind of a radical, radical idea. And, and it turns out that there are good, very good reasons why we feel that there's a disconnect between what we want to be able to take in and what we feel like we can actually process. Uh, here's Dr. Daniel Levitin. There's a certain number of decisions you can make before you deplete the brain's capacity for making good decisions. Uh, so do I read this one now or later? Uh, do I reply to it? Do I forward it to someone else? Do I mark it as spam? Uh, do I need to gather more information before I can reply? That's five decisions right there, and that's one email, and you haven't even dealt with it yet. <laughs> so our brains, they feel maxed out for a good reason. But we tell ourselves, and society tells us, keep going. You can do it. You've got to know what everybody is talking about, right? Stay up to date. Don't miss out. And anthro I spoke to an anthropologist, Genevieve Bell. Intel has their own anthropologist in-house. And she told me that families, communities, entire countries are trying to figure this out. What are the cultural norms? What are the expectations that societies are setting? Here's Genevieve. We're having that moment with the technology, right? Like we have fallen in love with it and it is all consuming. But there will be a moment when we need to put out the trash, go do the laundry, go talk to someone else. And I think where that moment fits and what the choices are we make at that moment will be really telling. But there's also a piece that says, how do you start to decide what the most useful things are that this technology does? How do you decide what the most important thing is that this technology does? Or more specifically, what 
is the most useful information that my technology delivers? That is the question I wanted to work with my listeners to sort out. And so we wanted to test a theory. If we could purposefully choose the right information to focus on, could we end FOMO, mitigate FOMO, and information overload? And so to start, we asked our listeners to sign up. Again, they were gonna go through this week of challenges, uh, every morning they'd get a podcast with something they needed to do. But first what we did was we asked them to choose a goal, to be more creative, to be more knowledgeable, to be more up to date on the news, more in touch with friends and family, or more in tune with yourself. For one week, all the information you took in that week would try to get you closer to that goal. That was what we decided. And then, and actually, psychologists say that sticking to a schema, this is what information goal is actually setting, I learned, schemas uh, are proven to help you retain more information, have better memory, and better synthesis of information. So for five mornings straight, each day we had something different. We sent out uh, texts in the morning, uh, in the middle of the day and at night to try and quantify whether any changes were happen happening and keeping people on track. We sent 300,000 texts that week. Uh, and we also had this really cool feature where uh, if you said you wanted to talk to me, there, your phone would ring and you could leave me a voicemail. We got 1,700 voicemails. I listened to all of them. Talk about information overload. And on the first day, we asked people to do something called single task. Um, this was an article that was in the New York Times uh, two Sundays ago that I was quoted in. So this idea of do just one thing. Do it well, focus, one thing at a time. And one of the reasons we did this was there's really interesting uh, research into our shifting attention spans. Professor of Informatics Gloria Mark at UC Irvine found that a decade ago, we shifted our attention between online and activities about once every three minutes. Now, it's every 45 seconds. The other thing is, when we do that, we've seen that the higher stress levels go up, the more you're switching, right? You never really get deep down into anything. Um, but we found that single tasking, another thing we did was we reorganized our phones, we streamlined them, we did all kinds of fun, crazy things. And, um, and here's what listeners told us happened. Hi, my name's Amanda and I'm living in Tucson, Arizona. And Infomagical actually has helped me realize how much I use technology as a way to distract myself from things going on in my life that I really actually need to sit down and process. I had a good cry in the Whole Foods parking lot, but it was something that I needed, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I was sitting on Instagram instead. My name is Brandon, and I live in San Leandro, California. Uh, it was really relieving to hear other people having these same problems with attention span and computers and cell phones. Do it until it's done. That is the essence of what this is all about. This isn't a perfect, it's practice. Hi, note to self, this is Dave from Shorewood, Minnesota. I did spend more time realizing just how much information and interruptions I have during the day, which I realized I can control myself. Today was a very good day with French. A couple of magical thoughts came to me trying to avoid looking at other things which are distracting is like a magic wand. It's sort of like that transformation in The Wizard of Oz when she starts to see everything in color. And you start to recognize what you really, really want and push everything aside with a little bit more aggressiveness because there's purposefulness. And you've been given permission right now through these exercises this is a gift. See you tomorrow. Good night. So just to wrap up, uh, at the end of the week, we had 30,000 people doing the project. 71% felt less overloaded. 79% said that they felt they could better manage information overload. On an individual level, I think the goal was to have a saner, more productive life, doing things that do truly matter to you. And on a macro level, there is an estimate that knowledge workers in the US waste 25% of their time dealing with their huge data streams, costing the economy up to $997 billion annually. So I believe that this is the new digital literacy, and I think that my audience is on the cutting edge, willing to figure it out with me. We are having a great time. 
It's a little weird, some of what we're doing, but it's also really fun, and I think we're getting to know each other and ourselves so much better. You can still do the project. We have hundreds of people doing it every single week. Um, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.